We're going to be looking at Psalm 76 tonight. Uh, love the Psalms because there is so much history, but also remember that being Psalms, being songs that they would sing in their worship services, that there's a lot of figurative language here. And as we look at it and study it and develop it, then we begin to see some, some things that uh, grow in consistency throughout the scriptures about uh, what God is likened to, what evil is likened to. Uh, so uh, this is one of those passages or one of those songs that, you know, we've got to have a few hints from the scholars back in those days so that we kind of get to understand what is being talked about. But, but as we begin, I ask you a question. How would you like to live with a lion? A lion. Remember the TV show, show Doctari? Quite a number of years ago, it was about uh, a ranch in Africa. They had all kinds of wild animals there, but they particularly had Clarence the Cross-Eyed Lion. <laughs> And Clarence, the cross-eyed lion, he was cross-eyed. And you know, when they showed a camera shot of what he was supposedly seeing, uh, it would be double, because it would be cross-eyed. And of course, there's the born free, an animal that was raised in, a uh, lion raised in captivity, Elsa, who was sent out. But uh, just imagine that, living with a lion. Now, of course, for the program, for all practical, Purposes, Clarence was a mild mannered lion. Except if you were bothering someone that he really cared for there on the ranch. If one of the ranch hands or the, the doctor or whomever uh, got into trouble, someone was bothering him, he could become ferocious in a very short period of time. That is the nature of lions, see? And he goes from meek and gentle to being ferocious. And that's where we start off this psalm, this song that they would sing. Uh, the first three verses, Psalm 76. In Judah, God is known. His name is great in Israel. In Salem also is his tabernacle, and his dwelling place in Zion, there he broke the arrows of the bow, the shield, and sword of battle. And there's that little word selah that kind of means meditate for a moment. Stop and think about what's being said. So what the ancients taught about this psalm was that God here is actually being pictured as a mountain lion. One of the mountain lions there in Judah. Uh, a powerful mountain lion who dwells, though, with his people not to afflict them, but to protect them from their enemies. The weapons of man's warfare are useless against him. Now you think about some of the Bible characters who grow in prominence, and you think of Samson who killed a lion with his bare hands. You think of David, who, while guarding the sheep, killed a lion that came to take the sheep. Now, there you have a connection, see? Because David was a little more powerful in the thought process, reasoning process, the way to take care of this problem, see, than uh, as we would look at, see? And, and, because of this, we say, believe that God was with them. God was helping these heroes. And there was another man who later on, after David, we talked about it a few weeks ago, his name escapes me, but uh, he killed a lion in a snowy pit. Or in a pit on a snowy day. So you, you have this, and, and if somebody kills a lion, then there, there's something special about them, they would say. So it's suggested that uh, this, you know, is looking at God as that powerful lion and also suggesting that this 
psalm was written, it's not a psalm of David, it's a psalm of Asaph, but written maybe down about the time that the Assyrian army has defeated the northern kingdom 720 B.C. and has dropped down to attack Judah and has built siege walls around Jerusalem and has besieged Jerusalem for a couple years already. And you can go back and read the account, see how terrible things were. There's a king by the name of Hezekiah, though. And Hezekiah was a good king, one of the few good kings that we read about in that later period of time. But he was a good king. And what happened was, as he started his reign, uh, he had taken over from a bad king. And, but he was a good king, but he had to change many things. And there was a repentance in Hezekiah. You read in the book of Isaiah and in uh, 2 Kings, uh, 2 Chronicles. But anyway, you read about how the, the prophet Isaiah comes to him, and, and God gives him 15 years to live. And Hezekiah repents on his bed, and before Isaiah could get out of the courtyard, God sends him back. Tell him he's <coughs> going to live. Tell him he's going to have children. And tell him he's going to be all right. So, tell him it's going to be okay. Because God is going to fight for his people. Now, how did God fight for his people? In one night, 185,000 Assyrians died in their sleep in the camp outside Jerusalem. 185,000. God took care of them. God protected his people. And King Sennacherib, kind of with his tail between his legs, the old expression, went back to Assyria. When he got back there, his sons were so upset. They followed him to the temple and they killed him and took over the kingdom. But Assyria was on its way down. Babylon would be the next kingdom, empire to come along. So what we have here, oh, and that, that's from 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 35 through 38. So idolatrous Israel, the northern kingdom, was destroyed because they were in rebellion to God. But the southern kingdom under of Judah, under King Hezekiah, who repented, was saved. God working, God dwelling with his people. And, and one of the most powerful lessons that can be learned from this event is this. God dwells among those who know him. And if we truly know him, key to the rest of the, the psalm is we will fear him. If we truly know him, we will fear him. I had a, a Bible teacher in... Uh, school of preaching that, that used to talk about, well, what does it mean, uh, you know, to fear God, you know? And it, it's not necessarily that we should be afraid of God, but yeah, yeah, if we're on the wrong side, if we're not doing what's right, then yes, we should be afraid. But uh, he told a story about asking these things in class, and one girl who was in the class said, well, the proper fear of God is that I'm afraid not to do what God says I need to do. That's where the fear comes. When, when God is on the other side, when we put God on the other side, because God is going to accomplish His will. His instructions are there to help us. Uh, the Marines are not our worst enemy. If it comes down to a battle, God is our worst enemy if we're on the wrong side. So this, this <coughs> psalm really holds up the excellency of God and tells us to have that proper fear, proper respect for God and His Word. Verse 4, You are more glorious and excellent than the mountains of prey. Now the mountains of prey maybe would be the mountains uh, and the one who seeks the prey on the mountains. The lion is called the king of the jungle and it's all that because it's a majestic animal, it's powerful, it's fast, it's deadly. So here, God is, is projected as a mountain lion, not the jungle lion, 
but still that, that mountain lion was as fierce and as majestic as what was that jungle lion. And he's pictured here, God's pictured here as a mountain lion descending the hill after he has killed his prey. After he has taken care of the enemy of the people that he was there to protect. His people, his people of Judah. So that's why it's, it's kind of put in that context of the Assyrian defeat at the time of uh, when Northern Kingdom was destroyed but Judah and Jerusalem survived. Now in Psalm 75, the psalm just before this, there's the analogy used there of the wild mountain ox. And this was another very powerful creature, strong, and, and not many animals out there would go up against a mountain ox because it had those huge horns and it was strong powerful body and it had a stiff neck a stiff neck now a stiff neck was its weakness a stiff neck wouldn't allow it to look around the mountain lion as strong as powerful had an advantage with its quickness to get in there to defeat take down these mountain oxes. So this is a fitting picture, this ox, of the Assyrian army under Sennacherib. Yeah, it was huge and powerful. It, they had defeated nations all around, and finally they were coming to Jerusalem to defeat Jerusalem also. Powerful, but stiff-necked. Now, in the New Testament, when people are talking about being stiff-necked, they're talking about being stubborn. The children of Israel say they were stiff-necked because they wouldn't even consider Jesus as being the Messiah. Stephen talks about it. Stephen calls them stiff-necked and uncircumcised of heart. And that's when they picked up stones and stoned him. They didn't like that. But see, their own stubbornness, their own unwillingness to look at the situation and take the best route led to their own downfall. So the lion was one of the few animals, again, that could take down the mountain ox, but there's that picture. You have this, this mountain lion, God, who protects his people, and here's the mountain ox that's coming in to destroy the people, and who wins? Well, it's that mountain lion. God portrayed as a lion. So our image of God should be that of a conquering hero. Conquering hero. Thank God. Think of David when he come back from fighting Goliath, carrying the head of the giant Goliath. Now he was just a young man. He, he was just a little guy. Skinny, ruddy is what he's called. A stripling but yet, I bet he looked ten feet tall in the eyes of his people when he defeated Goliath. When he stepped out by faith, understanding that he could do it when God said God had trained him to do it. Imagine Jesus entering Jerusalem that one last time. Called the triumphal entry few days before his crucifixion. And as he comes into Jerusalem, people are throwing down their cloaks and palm branches and they're shouting, Hosannas to the son of David. Now, that word Hosannas, it's actually Hebrew. So you have a little bit of Hebrew written in along with the Greek in the New Testament, but that word means Oh, save us. Oh, save us, son of David. David that killed Goliath. David that led Israel in battle. 
They knew that Jesus was the son of David, that he arose out of the tribe of Judah, a direct descendant of David. And they were calling for him, save us, save us. And you know what he does? He goes into town, he looks around, comes out. Next morning, he goes into town and he drives the money changers and the merchants and the livestock out of the temple for the second time. He did it at the beginning of his ministry, and he does it at the end of his ministry. <laughs> what does that tell you? The Jews were pretty stiff-necked, weren't they? They were stubborn. They were going to do it their way regardless of what God said or what the son of David said. And he comes in and, and drives them out again. Of course, now the first time, it's kind of like... Uh, who, by what authority do you do this? And he says, well, you destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And it's, it took us 46 years to, to get this temple built and all the buildings, and yeah, destroyed, you're going to, you're just nuts, you're crazy. Get out of here, leave us be. We're not even going to pay any attention to you. But see, that wasn't their attitude when he came in and did it the second time after those three years. Because then they had already decided in their minds they were going to kill him. They could not have him preaching and teaching in Israel because he was changing people's hearts. He was getting people, bringing people back to God, the Jews back to God. And the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the priests, the chief priests, the Sanhedrin, the, they were counted as nothing. Could you imagine what they thought when those people were saying, Oh, save us, son of David. Jesus' victory for Israel came with his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. And that's our victory that we can share in also. Verse 7. You, yourself, speaking to God, are to be feared. And who may stand in your presence when once you are angry? Who can stand in God's presence when God is angry? What does the book of Hebrews say? It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Why? Because our God is a consuming fire. Now, if you, you think about it, and just look at those two points. Burn it to the ground. They had been God's people at one time, but they walked away and they worshiped idols. Go back and read the history of the destruction of Samaria, the siege that took place there, and see how terrible it was on those people. We can't even imagine it today. See, God allowed them to be destroyed because of their rebellion, because of their stubbornness. But when it came to Judah, because of, of Hezekiah's repentance, see, they were saved for 120 years or so until they fell into the same pattern and fell away. When, God, when God's patience runs out, his wrath is full. Who can stand in his way? His will is going to be accomplished. Now you think of, in the terms of Noah, Genesis chapter 6, 7, and 8, say, God comes to Noah. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Everybody was in rebellion against God. Their thoughts were evil all the time. God said, build an ark for the saving of your household. Gave him 100 years to build the ark. And to preach repentance to the people for a hundred years. And still only, only Noah and his family went in the ark. Who could stop the flood? Couldn't stop it. The only thing you could do is get on that ark and let the water that was destroying the world lift the ark and save you. Pharaoh endured ten plagues. 
remember the last play was against the, the oldest son. We talked about that before because the oldest son, he, he's considered a god because Pharaoh's now a god, so his replacement, his, the next in line would be God. The, the oldest son was destroyed. So he survives those ten plagues. They run the children of Israel out of Egypt, and what happens? He's so stiff-necked, so stubborn, he chases them, and he drowns in the Red Sea. The action of God against the Assyrian army becomes a proverb for all men. We must stand before God in righteousness. God isn't going to protect us just because we say, oh, but, oh, I'm, I'm for God. God protects us when we hear Him, we trust Him, we obey Him, and we do His will. That's simply how it is. So God was giving Judah and Jerusalem kind of a warning. Hezekiah heeded the warning, turned to God. But again, Judah only remembered it for a little over 100 years before they're destroyed by the Babylonians. So our hope, our hope can only lie in trusting and obeying God. Now verse 10. Listen to what the psalmist writes here. Surely the wrath of man shall praise you. With the remainder of wrath, you shall gird yourself. Surely the wrath of man shall praise you. How in the world could the wrath of man praise God? Well, here's simply how it is. Because God just said he will destroy the wrathful. You think about that we were talking about the Sermon on the Mount a little while ago. When Jesus said that, uh, you heard it said to those of old, you heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders is liable to the judgment. But I tell you that everyone who is angry with his brother is liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother is liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, is liable to the hell of fire. The wrath of man against God, the wrath of man against man, is the evidence that the righteousness of God to destroy those who are in rebellion to him is proper. It's the right thing to do. So man's wrath will not only be overcome, but they will be made subject to God's glory. And you think about how God did it. Once again, you know, here's the flood. God did that. But look at some of the things that happened in the history of Israel and Judah. How that here's, here's this terrible people that comes in and punishes Israel and Judah for their uh, rebellion against God, but it isn't very long before those nations are destroyed. And, and you can go to the book of Daniel, look at the prophecies that are there, and you find out, you know, the four kingdoms in particular, the Babylonian kingdom that destroyed the Assyrian kingdom, well, it was destroyed by the Medo-Persian kingdom. And the Medo-Persian kingdom, it was destroyed by the Grecian kingdom, the Greeks, Alexander the Greek, Greek and, and such. And, and even that was destroyed by the Romans. The Romans lasted the longest and were the most powerful. But see, even in that prophecy, the kingdom of God would overcome it. The Roman Empire. When was it destroyed? Scholars can't say when it was destroyed. Some say 472, 474, 476. They don't know. Why? Because that prophecy said that that rock that's cut out, a kingdom that will never be destroyed, falls on that statue that represents those kingdoms, and it just falls to dust and blows away. It's gone. The Roman Empire's gone. Church is still the kingdom of God still here will be till the last day. And then the wrath of God against the ungodly 
will be brought out in its fullest measure. So man's wrath will not only be overcome, but made subject to God's glory. Someone said that furious winds often drive vessels the more swiftly into port. You know, they, they put these breakwaters out there uh, along like the Mediterranean Sea and even along oceans so that boats can go into that breakwater, so they get behind it to, and to a safe harbor, and there the waves are going to be beating on the shore and driving those ships into the shore. You think about in the book of Acts when Paul's on that ship where they're coming in, it's been stormy, it's been dark, and they have to go in. They, they actually have to wreck the ship to save themselves. And they're throwing everything overboard, throwing the tackle overboard. Get it up high, see, so it's on top of the water. When it goes in, it'll go in further. And then when you get to a certain point, you throw the anchors in to kind of slow it down because it's violent. The, the waves beating upon the ships tear the ships apart. And that's like the wrath of man, see? Uh, the wrath of man is like a furious wind that drives, drives, see, they're coming into port. Oh, we've got to slow down. We can't slow down because the waves are hard and the winds are hard against us. And you can imagine what would they do? Run right into the dock and just tear everything apart. Or up on the ground, tear it apart. The devil blows the fire of man's wrath and melts iron to fashion the weapons of war. But it's the Lord who fashions the iron for his own purposes. He's in control. He will use the wrath of man to bring forth his will, his purposes. But he's in control. And he won't do anything that's not right. The most rampant evil is still under God's control. In the end, it will be overruled. What? What will be overruled? Evil. Man's wrath. It'll be overruled for God's purpose. 11 and 12 form the conclusion. Make vows to the Lord your God and pay them. Just don't say, I'm a child of God. Be a child of God. Just don't say, I trust in God. Really trust in Him by obeying His will. Being obedient to Him. Let all who are around Him bring presents to Him who ought to be feared. And what are those presents He wants? We talked about it this morning again. Romans chapter 12, verses Verse 1, okay, he wants us. He wants us as a living sacrifice. He wants our love. He wants our obedience. He wants our devotion. That's why he created us, so that we can be satisfied with him and he can be satisfied with us. He shall cut off the spirit of princes. He is awesome to the kings of the earth. When they, when the kings of the earth, when the rulers acknowledge God, good things happen. Good things happen for them and for those they lead. But see, when they rebel against God, bad things happen. Terrible things happen. Let's be in obedience to God. Let's remember God is the one to be feared. Yes, we need to love Him, but we've got to remember that rebellion against Him will be repaid. See, that, that's what it is. He says, I am the Lord. I will repay. And we can't gain a righteous person's reward living an unrighteous life. He knows who are His own, and He will protect them. He will keep them the very end. Thank you for your time. The lesson is yours. If you have any need tonight, let your request be made known as we stand and sing the invitation song.